This morning, as I mentioned earlier, we are diverting just a bit from the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at Matthew. So if you would like to follow along, you could turn up Matthew chapter 20. Our text is verses 1 through 16. And the reason why we're looking at this, as I mentioned, was we're twofold. For one, the next text in Mark actually is very good for our evangelistic service next week, so I thought it would be good to space it out a bit. But also because this parable is actually meant to expand on those last words of our text from last week in Mark, in Mark chapter 10, verse 31. Now, you don't need to turn that up because the closing verse in chapter 19 of Matthew is exactly the same, and the context preceding it is exactly the same for this parable we're looking at this morning, which in my Bible is entitled Laborers in the Vineyard. So let me first of all read the parable, and then we'll spend a bit of time considering it. So Matthew 20, beginning in verse 1. Uh, let me uh, just start in verse, chapter 19, verse 30. For many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you too go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. Again he went out the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here all day long? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You too go into the vineyard. And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, and they also received each one a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Thus, the last shall be first and the first last. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we saw last week that in order to inherit eternal life, we have to be willing to give up everything that we have to the Lord. Again, we saw that with regard to Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. Everything we have must be his. As John Gerser once said, as he was relating a sermon that he had preached in one particular congregation, he said, if you have so much as one nickel that you claim to be yours, you can't be saved. Basically what it means is there can't be any holdouts with regard to the Lord. You have to give yourself in its entirety to him. It's an all or nothing proposition. By the way, that applies also to obedience. It applies to uh, repentance. Uh, it applies to our commitment to the Lord. It has to be all or nothing. The Lord does not want us to hold anything back. And that, inclu that, that includes everything that we actually possess. But that's exactly what every Christian is going to be willing to pay. Now, you'll be willing to do this because, as we're also going to see this evening, the Lord has actually put it in your hearts to do this because you love him, because you know it's right, because you know that whatever you have, including your life, your existence, everything, belongs to him. You're just simply recognizing that. And you're also going to do this because of what you'll gain. Remember what Jesus Christ said to his disciples. Everyone who has given up family will receive a much larger family. Everyone who has given up their possessions will gain many times more here along with persecutions, but also eternal life. And that certainly applies to you as well as to them. 
And also, don't forget this, that when Jesus says that you have to be willing to give up all your possessions to follow him, he isn't saying to you that you need to liquidate all your assets and give everything you have to the poor, to the church, or whatever, as he told the rich young ruler. He said that to him because that was an idol to him, and he knew that that was the big area that the man had that was lacking. His riches were his God, and he had to give that up. Jesus isn't saying you have to do the same thing, but he is telling you this, that you do have to have a loose hold on the things of this world and be ready to part with those things with some of them or all of them at a moment's notice as a part of your stewardship to him. Now, the Lord may never actually tell you to do that, but if he did say to you, for instance, I want you to uh, give up what you have here and go on to the mission field, well, then you need to be willing to do that. We need to be do, willing to do whatever the Lord calls us to do. And if there's anything that you have that you're not willing to give up for him, you actually love that thing more than him. That's actually an idol in your life that needs to be gotten rid of. You don't want to hold on to anything that means that you're going to, to perish in the, in the process. Again, remember, when the Lord gives you this supernatural love that makes you trust in him, it, it gives you the ability to, to give up everything and to love him most of all. So that's really a test of where you're at. But then last week we also saw that Jesus closed on a particular point and one that will actually occupy our thinking not only this morning but also a couple weeks from now. One that will help you actually gain more of these blessings because it's going to help you let go of what you actually have here. Now Peter pointed out to the Lord that he... And all the disciples had actually done what Jesus had called the rich young ruler to do. Lord, we've given up everything, and we've followed you, so what will there be for us? Well, Jesus said, your blessings are going to be many. And um, actually, they're, they're a little bit more than what Mark recorded. They're going to gain more brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, and possessions and so forth. They're going to gain eternal life. But he also said to them, in verse 28 of Matthew 19, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, these are great blessings. Now, having just said all these things, Jesus goes on to say something that was meant, I believe, to ratchet them down a few notches, to humble them, because things like this can certainly make you prideful. He said, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. Now, as I mentioned, Mark did not record what comes next, but Matthew certainly does. And since this is such an important point, I thought we should pause here and consider it, especially because we're going to return to this topic in just a couple of weeks uh, actually, the next few verses uh, after the ones we're going to be looking at this upcoming Lord's Day. So let's consider that this parable this morning is meant to teach the disciples and to teach us as well a lesson in humility. Now, I want to say at the outset that this parable is a difficult parable to understand. And there are a variety of interpretations on it. And I want to deal with a couple of those interpretations because each of them are drawing elements out of this passage which are helpful to us. And there are things we can learn from it, but I do want to land on what I think is perhaps what the Lord Jesus has in mind. So first we're going to approach it with a bit of humility and admit that we may not know everything about it, but we do know certain things about it. And one thing we know with absolute certainty is that Jesus, through this, is meaning to teach his disciples humility. So here are the three points that I would like us to see again based upon perhaps three interpretations. First of all, you should be humbled by the fact that the Lord calls you into his kingdom at all, that you're able to even labor in the vineyard. Secondly, you should be humbled by the fact that you haven't done more for the Lord than you, than you have. I think we can all agree these things are true, even if this parable would not be teaching it. But finally, that you need to be humbled over the fact that the Lord is sovereign over 
who it is that will be serving whom, or who it is that you, in fact, will end up serving. You know, our uh, tendency is, as sinful human beings, and even as redeemed believers, we still have sin we have to deal with, is always wanting position, always wanting recognition, wanting other people to look at us, recognize us, say, that's wonderful, that's great, you've done well, proud of you, whatever it may be. We, we like that. We like applause. But I think the Lord is telling them here that your position uh, of privilege is, is not one that you should expect applause for, but rather it's a position of servanthood. You're going to be serving those who are coming after. So let's consider, again, different interpretations and different things we can learn from them. So first of all, you should be humbled by the fact that the Lord calls you into the kingdom at all. Now, what is it that we know about the parable? Things, I think, that really aren't up for dispute. Well, I think one thing is that Jesus is intending to explain the closing statement of the last passage we looked at. What it means that many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, in Matthew's gospel, I've already pointed out we have exactly the same context that we had in Mark. The same events have just taken place. Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler, his words to his disciples regarding the cost of discipleship. You have to be willing to give up everything to follow me. Peter's words to him on behalf of the disciples that they've already been willing to pay the price and Jesus promised to them of a reward. And then he closes with exactly the same words. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And then notice he closes this parable with these words again. So the last shall be first and the first last. I think it goes without, um, you know, without any dispute that what comes in between is meant to explain those words. Okay? So I, it has something to do with humility. Now here are a few other things that seem clear. The vineyard is the kingdom of heaven. The landowner is the Lord Jesus Christ. The workers are his people. The end of the day, I think, is the end of human history. And when he comes to pay his servants, that's judgment day, when all will receive rewards or punishments according to what they've done, whether you're a believer or unbeliever, of course. Now, notice that in this case, each man receives the same reward for doing more or less work in harder or easier situations. That's kind of the difficult thing to understand. And then the Lord purposely pays those who are hired last to make a point about his justice and his generosity. That he was just in giving to each worker what he agreed on the outset to give them. And that he was generous in that he gave to those who were hired later the same that he gave to the first group. So there's the justice of it and there's the generosity of it. Now what exactly was Jesus trying to teach his disciples here? Well again, it, as I've said, whatever it is, it has to be a lesson in humility. Now, first interpretation. Some believe that the Lord was trying to show us, or at least his disciples in those days, the reaction that they were going to experience as the Lord would later call Gentiles into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Jews in this interpretation would be those who were called in the earlier hours. They were the ones who were in the kingdom longer. They were the ones who uh, had to labor longer. They were the ones basically from the call of Abraham through the patriarchs and subsequent generations. The Gentiles are those who were called at the later hours of the day. They were called later in time, which means they would not have labored as long as the Jews and they would have not have, well, not have gone through as many difficulties as the Jews did. And as to the fact that those who were called first grumbled it may be expressing the fact that the Jews had a difficult time when the Gentiles actually were finally called into the kingdom, especially that they would partake of the same privileges, of the same covenants, without becoming Jews. That was a, a real you know, stumbling block for the Jews. The Gentiles could have all these things and yet not become Jews. As a matter of fact, that's what was dealt with in the Acts 15 Council, where it became clear that God was accepting the Gentiles through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and that they did not have to be circumcised or observe the law of Moses. They did not have to become Jews before they were saved. 
Well, by accepting the Gentiles by faith, the Lord is saying here that he's not shorting the Jews who labored for such a long time under more difficult circumstances, such as the ceremonial law, which are all pictures pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, but he gave them exactly what he promised, salvation through the Messiah that came by faith alone. Now, it may have looked to the Jews as though they had to endure hardship, the Gentiles didn't have to endure, and that they were made equals with them, and, and maybe they shouldn't have because they didn't have to go you know, nearly through the hardships. But again, Jesus was just giving them, the Lord of the, of the vineyard is giving to them exactly what he promised, salvation. Now, I should mention that everything that I just said is true. I mean, all those things are true. The Jews did have a difficult time. The Jews did labor you know, longer in the vineyard. The Gentiles came in later. It may not have been as difficult for them. But there is the question of whether or not this is really what the Lord is teaching here. It, it, it may very well be. And it would certainly have the effect of humbling the Jews who believed because they were first that they had a very privileged position in the kingdom of heaven because they were no longer going to be, claim, be able to claim that privileged position as God's people since the Lord was making the Gentiles equal with them. And God takes the Jews and the Gentiles, he puts them together into one new man, and they are equal in the Lord. In the Lord, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no distinction, but all are equal before the Lord, at least in, in a particular sense, that they have that same personal value to him that the other has. Now, if we apply that to ourselves, I mean, we need to realize that we're not Jews that are jealous of Gentiles coming into the kingdom. That really doesn't apply to us, but something like it does. I mean, think about, for instance, those of us who have been Christians for a while, and those of us particularly who have had to deal with hardship, and we've had to make sacrifices for the Lord, sometimes great sacrifices. Um, you know, sometimes we might be tempted when we see others coming into the kingdom later in life who don't seem to have to deal with the difficulties that we're dealing with and they enter into the kingdom of heaven, we might be tempted to think the same thing. Why did I have to go through all this difficulty and hardship? And the Lord made it so easy for them. Or perhaps we've been working for so long to, to do things for the Lord and somebody comes in and God takes that person and uses them to do something that's tremendous and the Lord bestows honor on them and we think, hey, I've been laboring, I've been doing all this work for all these years and the Lord hasn't done that for me. You see, we might be tempted to think that way, but just remember that if you ever are tempted to do this, that you don't deserve even what you have. You don't deserve the Lord's salvation in the first place. Everything you have is purely a gift of grace. And you may have had a rougher go than others. Certainly God's going to compensate you for those things in the end, but you're not losing that on anything. God is not shorting you. He's giving you exactly what he promised. And what he's promised is much more than you or I or anyone deserves. He's given you eternal life. I mean, to be in the kingdom of heaven at all is to be infinitely blessed. And the Lord certainly has a right to do with what is his, what he wants. If he wants to bestow honor on one part of his body and not upon another, it's certainly his right to do that. Now certainly, we need to be humbled by that possibility. And the only way that we can avoid getting incensed when we see God honoring somebody more than us or somebody having a much easier time, I mean, there was a time, for instance, I don't often like to use personal examples that just popped into my mind where I was struggling in the ministry years ago. Some of you know the difficulties that we had to face here in this congregation. And uh, there was a, a gentleman, actually it was George Scipione, who um, is the head of ICBD, the uh, Institute for Biblical Counseling and Discipleship. I'm not sure if I got that right. But anyway, uh, he had pastored for years in a, in a church in the same denomination. And he was telling me about it, what a wonderful time he had, you know, how the pastor had, had uh, shepherded the flock really well and the people were very hungry for the word and very godly and they were all working together and why well, I had just such a great time. I, you know, it's hard to understand how, why you're having such a miserable time. And my thought was, 
why did he get to do that and why did God put me in this kind of a circumstance and I was tempted to get upset about that. But I realized that God has the right to do that. I mean, he can, he can put me through much greater misery if he wants to do that. He can, uh, well, he can call, call for my life to be given up, whatever he wants. You see, we need to be willing to pay it, and we need to realize he has the right to do that. So we should not get upset. If he wants to bestow honor on someone else, actually, we're encouraged in Scripture, we're exhorted in Scripture, to do that ourselves, to try to give other people greater honor. We're tr that's the only thing that we're really authorized by the Lord to try to outdo one another in, and that is in giving honor to one another. So we're not supposed to try to get ourselves up here and push other people down. We're supposed to put ourselves down here and push other people up. That's the way it works in the kingdom of heaven. And you can only do that if you're humble. So the Lord wants you to be humble. That's what he is exhorting you to in this passage. When you really can see yourself as the least, which is what the Lord says, the one who's greatest is the one who's going to humble himself to become the least, it's only when you're humble that you can truly be thankful for the blessings that God gives to you, particularly, but also for the blessings that he gives to others. So humility is very integral. And again, with the disciples being Jews, thinking about the Gentiles coming in and so forth, the Lord might have been seeking to teach them humility at that point. That's one possibility. Well, secondly, you should be humbled by the fact that you haven't done more for the Lord than you have. Now, this is based on another view that Jesus is basically telling us here that everyone is going to receive the same reward on the day of judgment. They're thinking that this is, in essence, what this parable is teaching. Okay? After all, it doesn't matter how long you labored or how hard it was, everybody on the last day gets exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter how old you are then when the Lord calls you into his kingdom whether it's from the womb or on your deathbed. It doesn't matter what you actually do for the Lord in life, whether you give yourself unreservedly to serve the Lord in his kingdom or you actually serve him very little. It doesn't matter what sacrifices you make for the Lord, whether you give up all your possessions and go out into the mission field or whether you stay at home and really give up very little. It doesn't matter what happens, everyone will receive the same rewards. Those who were hired at the first hour received the same thing as those who worked from the 11th hour to the end who only worked one hour. Now, on the surface, it does appear that this is what the Lord is teaching. I mean, years ago, I was teaching a Sunday school class, and I was, I was teaching on the subject of degrees of reward in heaven because I believe there are degrees of reward according to what we do. And one particular individual who isn't in the church any longer, I can use this example now. As a matter of fact, there's always examples from the past we can draw on. He, he said, that's not true. There aren't degrees of reward, and this is why. And he pointed to this particular parable. Everybody gets exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter what you do. Well, the question we need to ask is, is that what Jesus is actually saying here? That everybody receives the same reward regardless. Well, I don't think he could possibly mean that because, for one thing, he's already told the apostles that they were going to receive a greater reward than everyone else who was coming before them because they had left everything and were following him. To whom else did the Lord ever say, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel? It seems to me that that's kind of a privileged position. Now, in just a few verses, James and John are going to come up to Jesus and they're going to say, Lord, grant that, that one of us can sit on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. They wanted positions of a privilege. But Jesus doesn't deny that those positions exist. He just simply says, it's not for me to give, but for those for whom the Father has prepared it. Those positions exist. There are positions of privilege and honor. Jesus told the rich young ruler that if he were willing to give up all his possessions and sell it all and give it to the poor, that he would have treasure in heaven. Jesus tells us actually to store up treasures in heaven. Why would he tell us to do that if it wasn't possible to do that? If everybody gets exactly the same thing, then he'd say, don't bother storing up treasures in heaven because everybody's going to get 
Exactly the same thing on the day of judgment. Why does Paul tell us that everyone is going to receive according to what they have done, whether it was good or bad, and that every believer is going to receive a reward based upon their works, some of whose are actually going to end up being worthless and burned up, all of it, and yet they're going to be saved, while others are going to have uh, gold and silver and precious stones that remain that they're going to receive a reward for on the day of judgment. See, there's several passages that indicate that there is, in fact, a reward for what we do and that everybody doesn't receive the same thing. And think about this as well, that if the Lord rewarded everybody's work exactly the same, then the person who received Christ on his deathbed would, would be rewarded in exactly the same way as the one who, who came to Christ early, whose life was a continual sacrifice to the Lord who endured all the different hardships that life can present as well as persecutions, may have even given his life up as a martyr. Now, that does not seem like it would be just for the Lord to do that. And not only that, and realizing too that any reward that we get is a reward of grace to begin with. We don't really deserve it. But God has made the promise that what we do for him will be rewarded. And if that's the case, the Lord will, he'll have to, uh, reward what we do if we meet the qualifications. God must, because he's faithful to his word, he must give us those things, even though they are only rewards of grace. But not only would, would that be inequitable or unjust based on the promise of God, it would also lay the groundwork for every one of us here to be tempted to become lazy. I mean, we would be tempted to do what, sadly, so many professing believers, in fact, do today, and that is just sit back and enjoy the ride to heaven. Because if there's no reward for anything you do, why do anything? Now realize that as Christians, love will always compel us to move forward, even if the Lord had not given us the additional motive of reward at the end of the road. But, but you need to realize the sin that we still deal with will definitely take advantage of the fact that there is no reward beyond what everybody else receives and will tempt us to do as little as possible for the Lord while doing as much as possible for ourselves. That's just the way sin works, which is why the Lord has given to us that incentive as well as the love in our hearts. Now, I should also point out that the Lord in this parable makes it plain that he wants us to work hard. I mean, none of the workers in the vineyard were taking it easy. All of them were working. Some of them worked harder than others. Some of them worked longer than others, but all of them were working. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And James reminds us that faith without works is dead. The Lord has actually recreated us. So he's made us new creatures in Christ so that instead of trying to get out of the work, we would actually do the work. I mean, the parable bears out the fact that all the workers, all the laborers in the vineyards are, are laborers. They are working. <laughs> but the Lord has also made it equally clear that he intends to reward each one of us consistent with our efforts according to our works. So I don't think this parable is trying to teach us that everybody's going to receive the same thing. That's what I'm trying to point out here. And I, I think it's also consistent with the fact that the opening and closing words are these. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus is definitely not talking about equality when he says that, the last will be first, the first will be last. If you applied that to our rewards, then what he would be saying is the more you do, the less you'll get. The less you do, the more you'll get. That's completely contrary to what the Lord actually teaches us in Scripture and certainly what he's teaching us in the context. No, I think the Lord intends something else. He doesn't intend to teach us that we're all going to receive exactly the same thing. The more you do for him, the greater your reward will be. So I just wanted to use this point to encourage us to do 
everything that you possibly can do for the Lord, realizing that he will not be a debtor to anyone. God will reward you with the rewards of grace according to what you have done. He will reward you for absolutely everything that you do for him, every sacrifice that you make for him. You will reap the benefits of those things forever. But I also, be, just in keeping with what I think the Lord is doing here, I want us all to be humbled by this, that we haven't done more in light of the love that we claim to have for the Lord, that we haven't done more for him or thinking about the things that we've done that aren't pleasing to him, that we would do those things in light of that, of the fact that we love him. That should humble us. Or the fact that God promises to give us rewards for every sacrifice, for every single thing that you do, that that hasn't moved us to do more for the Lord. So we should be humbled by this and set ourselves to do more for his glory. I mean, basically the Lord calls us when we take up the call to be a disciple, to pick up our crosses, which means we die to ourselves, die to what we want, and we say, not my will with the Lord Jesus Christ, not my will, but your will be done. That's why he saved us. He even promises to reward us for that. So we should be humbled by the fact that in light of all these incentives, we haven't done more in light of the fact that why he's called us in the first place, that we haven't done more and purpose to do more. Now, finally, you should be humbled by the fact that the Lord is sovereign over whom you will serve. Now, I think it is possible that Jesus had in view the, f the future bringing in of the Gentiles and the Jews' reaction to that. That's certainly possible, but it's also possible that he didn't have that distinction in mind. But he was simply encouraging his disciples who were called earlier that their labor would be greater than those who, who followed them, but that those who followed them would receive the same thing that they received, which is eternal life. They would all have the same status in the kingdom of heaven. And in the end, this great privilege they had was actually that they would end up serving those who would come later. Now consider the context. The rich young ruler could not let go of his riches, but he gave up the kingdom instead. But Peter and his disciples gave up what they had. And they had done what Jesus commanded. Because of this, Jesus said they were going to receive a, a greater reward. And when you add this to the fact that they were called first into the kingdom that Jesus Christ was, was bringing, and that they were going to have this great position of privilege, it adds up to a great temptation, I think, for them to think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. And I think that Jesus here is, again, trying to help them put things in perspective, not to become prideful that they had this privileged position, but rather that their work, well, they had a privileged position, but their work was going to be more difficult. Their work was actually going to not so much benefit them as it was going to benefit those who were going to come after them that they would be laying the foundation coming in at the earlier hour. They would be breaking the ground, as it were. That they would be working harder. That they would be making greater sacrifices than others who would be coming in later, even though they were going to receive the same wage, at least with regard to eternal life. It was a privilege, actually, for them to be able to do this harder work. In this sense, they were becoming servants. I think Jesus wanted them to see themselves as servants to those who would be coming into the kingdom of heaven later and who would at least have the same status they did. They would be equals, no Jew, no Gentile, no kings, no poor people, everyone the same in Christ. You are the first, Jesus is saying, but you will take the last position to serve those who are going to come later, that those who come in last might become first in this sense. They are becoming the focus of your ministry. Basically, you are working to help them. Now, I think 
I think that there's, um, I think if we understand things the way that we should understand it, that's really a privilege God is giving to them or that Jesus is giving to them. He's not trying to take a privilege away. I think he's trying to tell them that they are in fact to take a position of servanthood even as he did. I mean, he was the first, but he became the last in order that he might make the last the first in a certain sense. And I think he was doing the same thing here for his disciples telling them, you have this position of authority, this privilege, but you need to become the least, you need to become the last in order that you might lift others up. Now, think about this for a minute. If the Lord should put you through greater difficulties, if he should make you work harder, if he should make you the servant to other people, should you be upset if your work actually makes it possible for others to come into the kingdom of heaven or that your work makes things easier for them in the long run? I don't think you should get upset about that. I mean, after all, isn't that what service is all about? Isn't that what the Lord has called us to be? But it does run contrary to the idea of, you know, that we have in our sinful nature that we want to be first, we want the preeminence, we want people to recognize us. But Jesus is saying, no, it's just the opposite, and you should be thankful that you have that position. Now, I want you to realize that we are those that have come quite a bit later, and the disciples are the ones that had to labor earlier in the vineyard. They had much more hardship than we had. They had to struggle through things with much less than we have. And think about how you have benefited from that. How much easier it was for you to come into the kingdom of heaven because of the work that they did. Think about the hardship that our Lord Jesus Christ went through, laying the foundation, that of the, the work of the prophets and the apostles. I mean, can you imagine uh, living just maybe a, a few years outside of Adam's fall? How difficult it would be to come to faith in Christ. You would have virtually nothing of the Bible. Or if you lived in the Middle Ages, how difficult it would be. But you have benefited not only from this work that has come before we have a completed Bible, but from all the pastors, all the teachers, all the theologians, all the evangelists, all these people we like to look at when we study Reformation history, who have built a foundation for you. I mean, I'm thankful that I live after the Westminster Assembly because I really like what the Westminster Assembly had to say, their understanding of the Bible. I'm glad that I live after the Reformation and that I didn't live in the Middle Ages. I'm glad that I didn't live in the first and second centuries when all I had to rely on were the, what we call the church fathers. If you've ever read their writings, you'll see they went way afield of what the truth is. So I'd much rather be here than there. And the reason being is that the Lord has already caused others to labor much more, you know, much harder and much longer so that others could benefit after them. So I'm, I'm thankful for the work that they did. Now, if, if that's the case, if you're thankful too, then if the Lord should use you to make things easier or better for those who are coming after you, should that be something to complain about if you're becoming a servant to them? Now, I don't think any of us should complain. Instead, we should just be humbled by the fact that we are where we are, that the Lord called us when he did, that we have the benefits that he's given to us, that we are able to serve other people in, in any capacity. And we should also purpose to humble ourselves even more that God might use us even more. Now, I also mentioned last week at the very close of that sermon that if in this whole process the Lord should use you to bring somebody into the kingdom of heaven and then that God should bless them, or maybe he didn't use you to bring them in, but they came in after you, and the Lord should bless them and bestow honor on them, a much greater honor than he has given to you, that's also something I think Jesus is warning them about, not to be jealous about. These things are entirely in his hands, who it is that's going to serve whom. The Lord has honor to bestow. He can either give it or withhold it. It's entirely in his hands. And we'll see in a couple, again, in a couple of weeks that even the places of greatest honor in his kingdom on the right and left hand of the Lord Jesus Christ are for those for whom the Lord or the Father has prepared it. 
We shouldn't be jealous. It's only pride that brings jealousy. Humility says, hey, I'm glad to be in the kingdom at all, that the Lord used me at all. I mean, what greater, what greater privilege could there be than to be used of the Lord? You know, um, that particular principle was taken to uh, perhaps its logical extreme uh, during the time of the New England Puritanism, actually in the days of Jonathan Edwards, although I don't think he agreed with it. But there were many Christians who believed that you could not be a Christian unless you were so humbled that you were willing even to be damned in order to give glory to God. Now, it sounds very pious on the outset. Lord, do with me whatever you will. If you want, if you want to take my life, that's fine. If you want to make me labor for years in, in absolute hardship, that's fine. Do whatever you want, even if you want to damn me for my sins. Go ahead and do that. If that brings glory to you, I'll rejoice in that. Well, Edward said, I understand what you're saying, but that, that's going too far. No true believer could ever possibly desire to be damned for their sins and to be apart from the one they love the most for the rest of eternity, even if you think that's going to give glory to God. Now, that's, that's perhaps going a bit, uh, as I've said, a bit too far, but it isn't going too far to be humble to the point where you say, Lord, if you want me to be the least in your kingdom, then I'm going to be happy being the least because I'm doing what it is you want me to do. So we should not be afraid to be humble. And we should not, through that humility, be afraid to be thankful. That humility will make us thankful that we're in the kingdom of God at all. So again, I do believe that whatever the interpretation is, and I tend to think that the last one may be the, the appropriate one. I know the second one, as I mentioned before, I don't think is correct. First one is possibility. But each one of them teaches us a lesson in humility, and that was really what was behind what Jesus was saying. When he says, many who are first will be last, and the last first. The Lord wants to teach us humility. And so may the Lord help us to humble ourselves by his grace, and that we might be thankful for whatever he gives us, whatever he calls us to do, whatever he uses us to do at all, that we should try to humble ourselves more so that we might be more useful. Again, when we get to um, a little bit later, we're going to deal with how humility will help us serve the Lord better. I hope you're already getting some idea of how that is. God's not going to use you if you're prideful, for one thing. But why is it that he can only use those who are humble? If we know that's true, let's try to humble ourselves more that we might become more usable to him. And let me just close by saying this, that if you have not yet humbled yourself to the point where you realize that you can't make yourself acceptable to God except through faith in Jesus Christ alone, that's where you need to begin. You need to humble yourself to trust in Jesus as your all in all and realize that you cannot save yourself. You can't do anything towards your salvation. All your works are like filthy rags before the Lord, as Paul says. It's like a mountain of dung. Even the things he did trying to keep God's law because he didn't do them out of love for the Lord. Well, may the Lord grant you grace to see that and to humble yourself and to come to Jesus Christ that you might have life. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us apply what we've heard regarding humility and uh, that he would help us to uh, become more humble servants of his.